seven o'clock. Do you know where your freedom is? We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Well, I mean, the easiest way to figure it out is just to remove all of these adapters that I bought that are somewhat suspect and also remove some of the equipment that's depending on that and figure out another way around it somehow. Speaking of suspect things that are probably broken and need removed, people have been asking about you and I getting together to have a conversation like we're getting ready to have. Yeah, I feel like it's been a long time fucking coming. I always forget that you record right off the bat and then all this inane stupid shit that no one gives a shit about and me asking you like a dick if you know what an XLR plug is. That's all going to be in your show. <laughs> it, it, it might not have made it, you know? Uh, <laughs> no, leave, leave it in. It's real. I'm I'm really an asshole when it comes to talking tech to people. I always talk down to people. It's fine. <laughs> I try not to, but I have to admit that I do. <laughs> but no, when we're doing political commentary, we want people to want to welcome us into their ideologies so we'll, we'll either bear bear it all right there or we'll just have you talking about it having happened but you know since we're gonna make make all the new people like us and keep the people that are liking us that already like us right now satisfied that's punditry right there yeah it's also an old irish ad- adage like those who love us may they love us more and those who don't if God can't turn their hearts, may they turn their, their, his, their ankles so we'll know them by their limping. All right, so the world is fucked. Uh, let's, just, let's just say that right now. I mean, we can do the commentary because it's a nice uh, stress relief valve for all of us, but um, climate change is reaching the point of no return. What is it, seven degrees Celsius? I think I read somewhere that we've reached in the Arctic regions or whatever it is that is like we weren't thinking we were going to be there till 2100. We're 80 years ahead of schedule, and they just keep moving the degree of temperature to what they think is the point of no return because they're like, well, clearly we can still come back from this, right? Um, And I'm betting that we're not. So none of this really matters anymore. Human history is pretty much going to be erased when the climb apocalypse comes for all of us. And the asylum, I have that patented, so don't steal that. (laughs) At the very least, people will find themselves suddenly with oceanfront property. Uh, Yeah, oceans levels are going to rise. So that really shitty movie that John Cusack was in in 2012, that's going to happen. We're all doomed. And none of the stuff that we're about to bitch about even fucking matters anyway. So let's go. (laughs) Cheery as ever. Cheerful as ever. (laughs) Tell us how you really feel. It's all fucking over, man. It's just there's no fucking point to any of this anymore. I mean, Nazism is back and it's out there all over the place. Uh, This civil rights unrest that's happening is slowly trying to be turned into a second civil war by a bunch of racist fuckers that want to play soldier. Uh, Trump has embraced that and basically realized that the only hope that he has at this point, because he's not getting reelected, is to actually fuel this civil rights uprising. As far as I'm concerned, this is commentary. This is my intuition or my suspicion that he's basically fueling this fire. He's trying to get it going. He's trying to get it stoked and trying to get his followers to go along with it because if he doesn't overthrow the fucking government as it is right now, it's all said and done for him. And everything that he's been fucking lying, cheating, and stealing to get his way through is going to come out if he gets unelected and is able to basically be overthrown all at once he's fucking done so this is his last ditch effort and that's why it keeps escalating worse and worse are are you uh hopeful for there to be a positive non-violent result in his uh return to jonestown campaign ramble tonight no i no. honestly I'm, I'm not i i think that because there's a there's a group of um second amendment uh gun rights uh african americans who are going to be doing protesting outside of the rally. And if there are black men and women with guns coming to a fucking neo-Nazi rally, which is, let's face it, let's not even mince words anymore, that's all Trump's shit is, is a fucking neo-Nazi rally, there's bound to be someone else that's at the rally or outside the rally that's a counter-protester that's going to be this white nationalist fucks that is going to clash, there's going to be a fucking shootout, and something bad is going to happen. That's the way that I, that's that's my prediction now. I hope I'm wrong, but 
negative Nancy Court here just wants to say that something really bad will probably happen on June 20th tonight when this rally hits. If it hasn't already and it just hasn't been reported yet. Well, yeah, I mean, what <clears throat> the the mayor of Tulsa had declared a curfew yesterday because there were people already camped out. Uh, but then the dear leader t- talked with his f- good friend, the the president of Tulsa. and did, did he actually say that, president of Tulsa? No. <laughs> I think he actually <laughs> called him a mayor. But, he, you know, it's it's very possible. I mean, he did call what? The governor of Puerto Rico, the the president of Puerto Rico, I believe it's. Well, he also referred to his own son as Melina's son. <laughs> She's got a son. It might be Stormy's. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, like, mental state of the um, treasonous fucker in chief here is clearly not good. But the physical deterioration is something that he's having a harder and harder time hiding. And I do believe that the stress of the situation of knowing that whatever is waiting for him at the end of this presidency is probably putting a lot of strain on both his heart and uh, a lot of his cardiovascular system. I think he had a fucking stroke like months ago. When when was it that he got rushed to the hospital or did he get rushed again? As far as I know, he has not been rushed again, but uh, November 19th. I'm pretty sure it was the 19th. It was definitely November 2019. Yeah. He was rushed in a really strange time to the hospital to begin phase one of his annual yearly physical. Here we are. At like three in the morning. (laughs) Who does a physical at three in the morning if you're not a fucking Navy SEAL or some kind of special ops? You you know, you, you have no control over those times. Just like he had... He had to go inspect his panic room during the, at the same time when uh, there were protesters outside the White House. It's, you know, he, it's the deep state trying to keep him down. He's he's an outsider uh, fighter for the common common man. I call her shit on all of this, but OK. <laughs> all right. So <laughs> November, November 2019, he gets rushed and. If you look at his appearances right after that happened, he didn't really do much of anything, and he disappeared for a really long time after that happened. So they probably had to, like, quietly try and sneaky rehab him while he was hiding. And that's when things got really, really quiet from him. And then he started being able to be up and moving around and golfing again, like, in the spring. (laughs) Although he would go to Florida sooner, you know, in the winter, like a shitload. Yeah, I mean, but, he, was, he was golfing with Lindsey Graham right before uh, they assassinated that guy in Iraq around New Year's. Yeah, okay, so New Year's, but, like, about how long? I mean, I'm no medical expert here, but about how long does it take for th- physical therapy of the highest caliber or whatever, like, uh, um, not angioplasty, with the, the microsurgeries that they do now where they do, do the the... the they pass stints through various veins to open them back up and stuff. Um, my father, after he had a heart attack, had a couple of them was put in. Um, but I'm thinking, like, how long does it take for them to put stints into the right areas to relieve whatever might be causing a stroke? Um, especially if it's, like, a minor one, but it's still enough of a blockage to where it affects the brain. Like, how long does that take, and how much does physical therapy recoup you enough to where you'll be able to golf? But there's always telltale signs of any kind of a stroke event that will linger around for a while. Um, My father had a TIA, which is like a transitive one where it blocks, but then breaks up and it's short enough of a stroke that it doesn't do permanent damage. It's just enough to where it's alarming at the time and then you're fine. Uh, Depending upon where that hits, it can affect your speech, your motor skills and all of that kind of stuff. For my dad, it just made it sound like he was drunk as fuck or like high on dope because everything was slow and he was like having a hard time responding and his speech was slurred. Um, but one of the things that happens, because my, my grandfather on my mother's side also had se- several series of strokes. and But one of the things that happens is you get severe muscle weakness and um, motor control issues on one side of your body, depending upon which side of the brain strokes. 
it's always the opposite side, right? Because the left half of the brain, you're on your right mind, <laughs> so to speak, or, or controls the right side of the body. And on the right side of the brain, it controls the left side of the body. So his right hand is weak. And when he's going down the ramp, he's favoring his left side for every step. I'm betting that he had a stroke on the left side and is controlling motor function issues for his right hand and his right leg. And also he's a very frail, weak old man to begin with who's severely out of shape. So I think he may have had somewhere between a massive stroke that was an event that could have crippled him and a transitive, like somewhere in between there where it either broke up or when they rushed him to the hospital, they got the stint in to replace it. And I think he is refusing to do physical therapy because it is clearly clearly that his hand is not working to the point where even on camera, he compensates for it without even thinking about it. That's my suspicion. That seems to be a a pretty common idea or suspicion uh, from doctors. Yeah, uh, obviously doctors that haven't had the... I don't want to say the the fortune, the good fortune to examine him, but people who have uh, dealt with uh, strokes and things like that have been saying that. I, I mean, I know in his case, there is a lot of, you know, v- visual and other recorded data to to sort of make up for some of the physical examinations, but it's not straight up. Well, no, I wouldn't trust anything that's paperwork coming out of this White House. Everything has got the crayon fucking stain of him editing it or bar blacking it out with his fucking pen and marker. You know, like all of that stuff you can't really trust coming out of this White House. All of it's I mean, this is a man who thinks that every conversation he has should be declared as a uh, presidential privilege classified conversation because everything he's doing is breaking the law and he wants to cover it up. So I would I would not put it past him being the egocentric, scared little child that he is to be terrified for people to know that he had even just a minor stroke event that caused some muscular weakening or motor control issues, and that he's also such a fucking pig-headed dick that he refuses to physical therapy himself because that would be admitting to said weakness. Like, all of that stuff matches up. And I'm going by my own intuition and my own (laughs) misanthropic nature to not trust what people say and do. But like, even if it is the paperwork's there, I mean, he got this one doctor to say he wasn't obese and to just basically change the measurements of what he was weighing just enough to where the president could, you know, not be called obese. Like that little minor detail of just happening to be obese is more important to him to, to hide that than to do anything about his health and to try and make it to where he loses weight and he's fine. You know, like the guy plays roulette every fucking McDonald's cheeseburger he eats. And it, it, at his age, it's only a fucking matter of time. Yeah, he, he is high risk. And I feel like we're only kind of talking about, well, most of this is mental deterioration, but I feel like, and I could be wrong, that one of the reasons why we're just checking in on where his physical state is is because he's already making physical and mental state an issue in the election against other people so this well he's always been that way examined huh he's he's always been that way he has basically like any defense that you would say where all you can't pick on a old man's fragility has been ruined the minute that he put his hand up in such a manner to make fun of a reporter who had was it down syndrome not down uh, ms or something like that what was like some kind of i I believe the reporter has ms yeah yeah okay so the reporter had ms and he was making fun of him at a rally just for his own well-being and he he picks on everybody about any kind of appearance or physical trait that he possibly can any like childhood bully thing that he can grab onto so anyone who says that it's not fair play for us to comment on him on that can go right to hell because i mean like i'm i'm done trying to go higher like, Michelle Obama was wrong about that. There's no point in trying to go higher. They go low, we should go even fucking lower. That's <laughs> how I'm looking at it. Because there's there's no time left. It's all, it's all fucking over with for us anyway. Um, I should have checked to see if you had seen this, but I, uh, last night when we were making plans to have this little check-in chat, did you see what was going on with the uh, Southern District of New York? 
and Bill no, Barr I did not. And the okay, so yesterday evening, Bill Barr announced that the head attorney. For oh the, yeah, I did see that. Okay, so okay. the SDNY attorney is going to get fired. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yes, yeah. I am aware of okay. that now. So he said that he is resigning. <laughs> and then the guy, uh, Berman is their name, said, well, that's news to me. I'm not resigning. And, and you can't make me. <laughs> you can't make me. Uh, because, what, he was appointed by Jeff Sessions. There, There's two different ways that uh, that job can be filled. Uh, one path is presidential nomination, Senate confirmation. Another one that has some sort of a asterisk or whatever beside it is um, like A1 or some other variation, but it's, uh, I believe, nominated by an attorney general and approved by a court. It's some, it's some weird other way, but basically Barr... Trump would have to fire him. It can't be Barr firing him. And in this way, since he's in charge of the investigations into, you know, Rudy Giuliani, six different Trump properties, uh, the Michael Cohen thing where Trump is individual one. Uh, uh, That's confirmed else? now, right? Where everything is... Cohen is basically uh, individual one in all of these different things is Trump. They've re they've confirmed that at some point, haven't they? Uh, yes, that that has been uh, as far as I know, that has been confirmed that he is. In fact, un individual yeah, one. Un unindicted individual one. Uh, okay. One one of the cases they're overseeing Trump has, according to Bolton's book, which will probably inter jump around talking about that thing. Um one of them is a case that Trump has told uh, Turkish President uh, Erdogan that he would get, you know, squashed as a favor to him. Um, so I think that this guy is going to be gone. <laughs> I, I think he's going to be gone soon. But at least right now, the cases are still going on. And if Trump directly intervenes, not that that's it, grounds for impeachment again, isn't it? It would be not that. Yeah, but nobody's going to do anything about it. Like, ain't nothing going to happen. <laughs> There's just going to be the uh, something else for the Lincoln Projects commercial. Uh, right. Which nobody that really is going to vote for Trump anyway would pay attention to. There's there's no moderates left that ha there's no one that has not. That just there's no one in the middle of America that hasn't seen something that Trump has done wrong since coronavirus and this civil rights uprising, which, by the way, I've been referring to that as a civil rights uprising for the longest time. And I don't feel that that's hyperbole or like any kind of like I, I don't personally want it to be construed as like a down statement about this. This is definitely an uprising for civil rights. That's like I don't know how else to really phrase it because it's going international. It's not just here in the States, there are places that are protesting on our behalf elsewhere in the world in solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> That's the the whole, if the U.S. saw what the U.S. was doing to the U.S. <laughs> they, would, right. they would invade the U.S. and say they're installing a democracy. Right. <laughs> uh, I know uh, George Floyd's brother or cousin spoke to the U.N. about the police violence and racism in America uh, recently. How fucking hilarious would it be if the UN comes in to remove Trump before the election even happens? That would, <laughs> that would be wild. That, that, that would be... Monumentous? I, historic? If it wasn't... I, I really think that if it wasn't the United States, it would have happened. Uh, the US yeah. would be at the front yelling about it needing to happen. Well, under normal circumstances with a normal president and a non-white nationalist-based regime, regime handpicked by Bannon and Miller, uh, sure, that would definitely happen. The United States would give enough of a fuck to be like, hey, wait a minute, that country has national resources we need. Let's install freedom. <laughs> Ordinarily, that would be a thing that would happen, but 
<laughs> since we are the ones who have become the fascist state, we're not spearheading that now. Just working on what left the World Health Organization. Uh, there's they're always trying to get out of the UN and NATO. Oh yeah, that's like that was day one of the Trump presidency. He was trying to remove all of that because the one thing that he definitely doesn't want is accountability for any of his actions and the one place that he definitely can't control or spin or manipulate is an entire congregation of other nations leaders like they have all seen through him from day one you know i really wish that there would have been more focus on the reactions and more honest reactions of the other world's leaders after they melt met with him and dealt with him and basically, whenever they're making fun of him behind his back, I wish the world could have seen more of that. But they were so dignified in not allowing that to happen. Yeah, it's kind of picking on the picking on the stupid kid. I don't know if it's I. I don't consider it that. This is the bully, and basically, whenever the bully leaves the room, everybody makes fun of the bully for being so pathetic that he needs to pick on everybody else. You know. I mean, I, I've never way. met a bully that even his own toadies actually fucking liked and didn't rip on and make fun of when he wasn't there or she. Because let's face it, women can be bullies too. It's very true. Um, I don't know, man. It's yeah. It's so it, you had some things that you wanted to talk about. I feel like we've talked about some of it, but um, um, yeah. Let's uh, okay. So the the firing for the not firing, but the attempting to force someone that is investigating a lot of Trump investigations to resign, and then the person who refuses to resign. We're going to see how that end game ends up rolling out with basically he's saying, you have to fire me, and he's saying it specifically to Trump. And that's the whole of that story with what Barr was trying to do with his Saturday Night Massacre. Um, I saw a thing where, I think it was just an opinion piece, but there was something where it's like they're basically it's time to subpoena Barr and or arrest him if he doesn't show up to testify because the House has not been doing its job. The intelligence committees or the not intelligence committees, but the investigative aspect of both the House and the Senate have basically been letting Barr go with all of this stuff. And the call was essentially or there was basically a statement that it's time to really investigate and even judges are calling for it. And formers, uh, it's a pronoun is you say it attorneys general whenever they're multiple, right? Yes. Okay. So former attorneys generals have been calling for it. And I feel like everything is just basically on hold and on pause because everyone wants to see what's going to happen in six months in November. But like, I have this feeling that there's not really going to be much of anything left in six months in November. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wait, wait for the actual murder hornets to come up. Like everybody's forgot about them, but they're like the Spanish inquisition or something, I guess. I don't know. But like the way that things are going right now, it just feels like either everybody's gotten so much shock and awe and so much fatigue that they just can't fucking deal with it right now. Or there are just, waiting for the elections and they're trying to use all of this horror to have a landslide but nobody really seems interested in doing their fucking job in investigating Barr and at least removing him because he's the one that's really doing a lot of the toady work right now and if they could get rid of the king toad there maybe just maybe it'll anger Trump enough to him to slip up even more you know like maybe they should be applying more pressure to him but like everybody's just so busy doing what? What the fuck is the House or any Democrats even doing against this right now? Or what are they even the own Republican people doing? Oh, they have a super PAC that they created, the Lincoln Project, to try and dump Trump out of there. But that's only because they feel the like mass exodus that's happening from their own party. And they're just trying to save their own skin. And they want to just go back to the fucking slavery-induced white nationalist regime that the United States has been from its inception that no one wants to admit because the civil rights uprising has happened and it's thrown this whole new thing in. It's like scaring the shit out of everybody that is like really afraid that perhaps the end of white privilege is nigh. <laughs> you know, like it just feels like nobody wants to do anything because they're so terrified that the basis of this country 
which I mean, it still runs on slavery. They just found a way around it being based on race. Now it's based on whether or not you're in jail, because if you're in jail, you can be indentured servitude to the state and run chain gangs and do all this other stuff for no money. And that's where for-profit prisons come in. For-profit prisons are the modern slavery, right? I mean, let's just face it. That's that's what they've been doing. And it just so happens that a disproportionate number of people that are being locked up happen to be black. So that's not necessarily non-racially motivated. It's just they found an end run that the people that abolished slavery, quote unquote, put into the Constitution. And it just took how long for them to figure out, oh, wait, we can just do for-profit prisons and we'll have the infrastructure going again the same way. Well, yeah, because I mean, uh, the well, I forget what it was called, the prisoner lease program or something like that, right after slavery ended, was jailing people and then leasing them for free work back to the plantations that they were freed from. Right. It's the exact same fucking thing. They just found a way to make the rest of us you know, just forget about that that's what they were doing because, oh, well, they committed a crime, you know, but like how many people get railroaded through court all the fucking time that they didn't really even do the thing that they said that they did or get disproportionately sentenced. And whenever they started running out of things to make up to arrest people for, then that's when the quote unquote war on drugs really took off. And that's when a lot of things became scheduled narcotics. The old left hand cigarettes that all the quote unquote jazz musicians seem to like became highly illegal, so they had an excuse to, like, arrest them and throw them in jail and turn them into indentured servants, too. You know, like, this whole entire system, even when slavery was abolished, was just shifted over and sneaky put in place, man. Like, it never fucking changed. And none of us really talk about it. And, like, I, I myself am guilty from my own ignorance of not even realizing it that the programs that they put in prisons to force prisoners to work for the state, like that's always been basically the same thing since they abolished slavery. So they didn't really abolish it. They just shifted it to prisoners. Yeah. Uh, I was, I just started finally reading the, the new Jim Crow book. Uh, I've seen it mentioned a lot. I've had it on my shelf for about a year or two. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of my uh, recreational reading learning about Nazis. And I think, I yeah, I've, I've sort of switched my focus recently. Sort of trying to center on the... I love how you call that type of reading, like educational reading is leisure reading for you. But for me, it's educational. Like, it's not something that I enjoy doing, but it's like, I really fucking need to learn this. I don't know enough. So I'm going to sit down and read all of this information right now. Whereas you're like, man, I can't wait to be super depressed and devour all this shit. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, there's a reason why I've got five different books going in the background, because sometimes I just can't learn about the secret history of concentration camps and I've got to, you know, get a little bit more polished up on operation paperclip, uh, you know, it's see, I just watched that Amazon series and I learned everything I needed to know about paperclip. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, but hunters or whatever it was with Al Pacino. Ah, okay. Have you, have you seen operation finale? No, I have not. Is that readily available on streaming, or should I just go check my I'm, Just Watch app? I'm not sure. It was readily available on scre uh, streaming last... Uh, it's been months when I watched it. It's a Ben Kingsley uh, dramatization of uh, the hunting down and capture of Eichmann. Or Eichmann, or I don't know how you say it. I, However you want to pronounce it, yeah. yeah. Um, he plays Eichmann. It's more drama but it doesn't really take place largely at in germany it takes place where he went to be on the run uh, oh see hunters i don't know if you've seen the series or not and just for a quick rundown for folks that have not watched it it's a very modern stylized telling type tale but relatively historically accurate as far as i can tell but it deals primarily with 
Nazis that were brought over because of Operation Paperclip into America and modern day in the 70s or the 70s time frame, modern day um, Nazi hunters of Jewish descent that uh, teamed up to basically find and eliminate them one by one. Now, obviously, they are not doing this legally. It's extra legal, but there's a big difference between legality and justice. So it's kind of this really interesting moral gray area, gray area when you're watching it, that um, that they're they're doing this hunting down and killing and or torturing to find more of them, and going against it. So like I said, it's a little hyper stylized in certain aspects, but it also finds ways of being extremely educational. Because my wife was not aware of like Operation Paperclip before we watched the show, and then it has this thing where it just basically lays out like in this style where it's done like a game show where people are asking a bunch of questions, and they just lay out all the stuff about Operation Paperclip, and then also just general anti-Semitism and how like you know it's viewed to be kind of an okay thing. They just kind of like lay it all out in this weird stylized. Um, video game thing where like you know people ask a question and they throw up all the categories almost like family feud is like kind of similar to how they do it and then right at the end of this sequence the guy looks at the camera and goes says something about like bet you have someone in your family that would have gotten all of these and just like it's like he's looking dead at you through the tv you know like it's really accusatory but at the same time they do it in sort of a tongue-in-cheek stylized manner that I, I found the show actually pretty entertaining, but at the same time, it's super fucking depressing. So, you know, you want to learn a little bit about Operation Paperclip without doing all the work? Just watch that show. Did they talk about how Operation Paperclip's name change came came about? I know that the Operation Paperclip name came from the only thing that was left in the folders when they were done was a paperclip, or there was marks of a paperclip where they were all stuck together or something like that. It says something along those lines like that. Yeah, that's that's pretty close. And uh, it was called Operation Overcast to start. And it was they were tr- uh, uh, part of part of the program was, you know, moving the families of the Nazis, too, and keeping them in seclusion. And then all of you know, all the people who were supposed to not know anything about the program all the family members and shit started calling where they were living camp overcast. So they, they knew that the information wasn't as secure as it was supposed to be. So they, uh, it, that's how it turned into being renamed operation paperclip because of those reasons. Again, it gives you some of the history, but it also makes it very stylized. I don't want to say it's like, um, it's not like, you know, when Quentin Tarantino does a redux of history, like his, uh, Inglorious Bastards Tale, but it's very similar to that feel, you know, where like they they kind of change history just enough to sort of suit what they need to tell for the story, or they just kind of amp it up or amplify certain aspects of it. <clears throat> but uh, Jesus, we're way off the rails now. Um, so <laughs> we kind of hit the main stuff that I wanted to hit at, but uh, we we need to talk a little bit about some of the revelations with the uh, Bolton's book, which which is not really a revelation for anybody who's been really paying attention to just, and also being able to kind of read between the subtle dog whistles that aren't so subtle. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm being unfair by that. Like none of the stuff that Bolton said was really a revelation. It's just that it proves that he was in the room when a lot of this shit was going down or was aware of all this shit as it was going down and wasn't being left out of it. He knew about it. He should have testified when he had the chance about all these illegal things that are happening and that makes him somewhat of a pussy uh, accomplice, right? Because he wouldn't do anything to stop it. He just wants to sell his fucking book, right? Yeah, I think the deal, the book deal, was for something like $2 million. Yeah, so he sold out all of our civil rights and freedoms and his soul Again. for $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> Again, for $2 million. I mean, because he, he was... He was in charge, or no, the the bar. Well, they, I mean, they've both been around so fucking much, Bolton and Barr. But you know, Bolton, what? He was a big help in the invasion in Iraq. Uh, he and Barr helped 
get rid of that whole Iran Contra kerfuffle. Um, but yeah, Bolton, uh, it's been interesting, but unsurprising to see how people who were, I mean, another, another thing from the residency is that most of these people haven't been in the job for a long time. So it has, it isn't, well, he's changed so much in the last eight years. I just because I said that he's a, a totally honest, wonderful government worker two years ago when uh, when we were trying to get him confirmed, I I can say that he's always been a dishonest, terrible person uh, now when I'm trying to not anger Trump. Like uh, uh, Marco Rubio uh, said, you know, I have no reason to call Bolton a liar, and I have no reason to say the White House is lying. He can't even say Trump is lying because he'll, even if he's saying he doesn't believe it, that's just too much trouble to get into. <laughs> but then he, he, he said, but, you know, people write things in books. And if you're not there when it actually happened, even if people say that it happened and they write it down that it happened, you can't really be sure. Now, this is also a fucking guy that's in charge of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which all it's supposed to do is listen to people saying that things happened. Right. So basically, he's saying the evidence that you're seeing and the words that you're hearing are not the things that you are seeing and hearing. Like he's fucking 1984ing his statement about Bolton's book as best he can with this like double new speak, like out the side of both mouths as he's doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's Marco Rubio, the thirstiest <laughs> man in Congress. I don't know if you you might not have been paying attention back when he gave a response to a obama state of the union address no that was my introduction to marco rubio he was you know the opposing party usually broadcasts their party's retort to the state of the union and right. yeah marco rubio was in charge of one and he was just drinking water like he was in a sauna or I, I don't even know if you're supposed to drink water in a sauna but you know he was drinking water like he was on the beach and he was really fucking hot he's sweating and just he's like, drinking water like he just came out of the desert in that episode of better call Saul <laughs> uh so yeah that was that was sorry for anybody that has, has some other thing with Marco Rubio my my first thing was watching him on a video drinking like <laughs> mumbles wishes he could and Dick Tracy he's <laughs> Trump did it Trump did it um, anyway so yeah the Bolton book it's basically stuff that most people have said before I don't know if anybody's said that Trump said he's totally fine with China having concentration camps but I think everybody figured he would be well and and it's just like these, some of these things that Bolton is confirming that he was aware of happening are like humanitarian slash war type crimes that the UN should be stepping in and doing something about. And yet not even Bolton is being, you know, taken down or being charged with this. Like, like shouldn't Bolton at some point be in cuffs for all these things that he admitted took place, like that he was aware of and just let happen? Like, does this not make him an accomplice? Am I just being hyperbolic about this or am i wrong or, or what i mean is there's something he did something severely illegal in just holding on to all this and you know lying by omission essentially yeah i'm sure there there are people looking into uh reevaluating statements he has made in relation to this shit and i'm not really sure I, it, perhaps this could be i, I think uh, on his official toilet proclamation machine this afternoon, there were threats of bombs dropped on him too, or something like that. You know, one of the usual, I'm sort of admitting to things in the way I'm half-ass denying them sort of shit. Um, For everything that he denies, there's like four more things that he confesses to in the same tweet. <laughs> 
so uh, there is that i know you were talking about what what are people doing about bar and bolton and other things like that uh yeah I, I want that because like i'm seeing none of that and i'm losing obviously i've lost hope but like i mean like i've just i'm losing all all belief that anything will even come out of all of this like i honestly feel like if this is all said and done if somehow they get trump gone they're not even going to do anything legally afterwards because all the statute of limitations will be gone and they'll just be so glad to get them gone that they'll just shuffle them off and like ban them from twitter or something who knows but like it just feels like nothing is going to happen and no one's going to do anything about it and they're just going to get away with it all just like fucking bush senior did bush jr did and fucking reagan did they all got away with every fucking crime they pulled off i have to think no, i i am obviously much more of an optimist than you are but well, that we knew that even on the first recording that you and i did that's true i can't be the only person that has had this thought that thinking that maybe it will push people to pursue these things a little bit more well bar i don't know if you saw that bar is being sued in dc for the uh military going in and gassing and uh shuffling off the protesters so trump could do his weird waving the bible around thing uh the white house i think the secret service somebody else the department of justice and Barr as a person are all being charged in dc courts right now or sued in dc courts right now over that yeah, but even if the lawsuits come against them, what are they going to actually do? Like, are we talking injunctions for things? Are we talking, like, disbarment for stuff? Or are we just talking the taxpayers shelled out a bunch of pe money to the people that were wrong, or were wronged by this, and then everything moves on and they get to do business as usual? Because, like, lawsuits can mean many different things. Well, the, uh, I believe the personal charge, the, the DOJ charge, would mostly be some sort of punitive damage thing because of the whole qualified immunity that the Supreme Court wouldn't re-examine this last week. Uh, but the personal charge is something that is a removable offense. Um, with Bolton, uh, right now it's just the, as far as I can tell, just the beginning of... in going through his book, seeing what's said, seeing what's what can be backed up and corroborated. Um yeah, I yeah, I too think that Barr would be a better target or an easier target because also <laughs> Trump won't do everything to save anyone else except for himself. Unless it's a family member, but even then, it depends upon whether or not he's fucking them like Ivanka. Right. And, you know, uh, the niece, the niece has a book coming out saying part part of the, one of the things is... Uh, okay, can we, can we talk documents. about this? Yeah, let's talk about this for a quick second, right? Just before we get into the actual book stuff. Um, now, you have nieces and nephews, right? I have nephews, I think. You know, I don't have any nieces, but I have nephews. Um in your interactions with your nieces and nephews and in your life with your nieces and nephews, have you ever found a need to make them sign an NDA and pay them off to not talk about things that happened in their life with them? Nope. That I've even shared vacation homes with those people. <laughs> okay. Um, now, in this, in this scenario that we're talking about here, um, where you're required to force NDAs on everybody and everything... Um, if, uh, if you've done something that's so horrible to your own family that you then have to pay them off with an NDA and, and basically bribe them to go away and shut up, like, doesn't that automatically mean that everything in the book is automatically true since you can't, you're, you're like, they signed an NDA, they shouldn't say any of this. Aren't you just admitting that like, whatever's going to come out of this is going to be so horrible and true that you tried to cover it up with <laughs> paying them off? Like why don't you just shut the fuck up and let the book come out and then deny that any of that's true? Why do you have to specifically bring up the NDA? Like he, it's, he doesn't even fucking think beyond, you know, the, the outraged bully of you said you wouldn't say anything if I stopped punching you. Like that's his reaction for everything. Yeah. It, it's, it, 
he well one of the, like you were saying with people being too far gone now if they haven't left it it's like the whole saying the coronavirus and covid-19 is a hoax but making everyone sign a waiver that they will not sue you if they catch the hoax is Trump still, is he back to saying it's a hoax again? Is that what the whole thing they're trying to do is that it was overblown out of proportion, everything's fine, get back to normal? Is that the, the hard line for the in, current in power GOP? I, I wouldn't say that there is a single line because they're just saying everything so they can have someone saying the right thing. Uh, there, there is still discussion that people, there's, there's been accusations that people are getting sick on purpose to hurt his election chances. Uh, or that governors and all the other countries in the world don't want him to be reelected, so they're inflating the numbers. There, I they have. I don't think they've said it's a hoax in a while, but that was their invention, and I'm sure there will be signs at his Jonestown, Oklahoma rally. Uh, although <laughs> you know, he he also you saw that he took credit for making people know what juneteenth was it's not a lot of people had ever heard of it before that was disgusting that was a low even for him so um what are the bombshells let's get back to the the niece's book the bombshells are just basically how he treated his family right and the history of racism in his family i think i saw something like that like where she talks about that where there is a lot more involvement of racist stuff in the background of his family or something like that. Yeah, it's it's basically that and shady business practices uh, that have also been reported in other places about inflating the value of a property to take a loan out on it and deflating the value of the property to pay the taxes on it and uh, other shit like that. that. Yeah, just general money laundering shit that he's been doing pretty much his whole entire life that he learned from his dad because, let's face it, he has no other formal education and the fucker can't even read. Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, I, I don't know what you think about the, well, you know, there's all these revelations, bombshells, whatever you want to call them, about him coming out. I mean, it's not like uh, the 2016 election where the big Hillary thing and the big Trump thing happened a month or two before the election. But uh, there, there was the stuff about Roger Stone telling everybody in advance about the WikiLeaks shit. Um, yeah, I just saw that was that like that was a revelation that just came out like this Friday actual Juneteenth, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. That yeah, I did see a report about that. Um that that was a Bolton's book confirmation thing too, wasn't it? Or no, no, that was um the Mueller report. There's parts that have been unredacted. Now how the fuck did that happen? That's something that I wasn't aware of. There was, uh, there's still, <laughs> there was a judge, I think it's linked to the Michael Flynn case, where uh, it's either connected to or it's in the same D.C. court system, where, uh, you know, uh, the judge, when, when the DOJ moved to dismiss the cases against Michael Flynn after he pled guilty twice, the judge found that a little curious as, as you would as you would so they brought in uh an independent judge to review the case who found it very strange and i think they're deciding uh it has been recommended that the charges not be dropped and that it's <clears throat> very suspicious that bar i think the judge that got brought in said that it's almost completely obvious that the attorney general is intervening as a personal favor for a personal friend of the president. But the Mueller report itself, it was they were a judge had read the whole thing by themselves and ruled that Barr was misleading and shady as shit. Uh, <laughs> legal terms. Uh, <laughs> well, in legal terms, the the punk rock commentary translation is shady as shit, illegal. <laughs> yeah, it, in the interpretation of the redaction, so further redactions were filled back in or 
redacted. I don't know what the fucking word is. They were they were unredacted. Unsealed. They were like up. redacted documents were unsealed and um revealed. Whatever that Whatever that is, I'll look that up for you if you want to vamp on it a little more. No, it, 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 you can if you like, but it's basically a, part of the main plan of the Trump administration and his lawyer, Bill Barr, Roy Cohn, whatever his name is, uh, has been to stall. Try to stall as long as you can. And that's, I mean, that's a thing that Trump has done forever is just tie people up in litigation until they get bored or, you know, you can uh, just say that you won and no, half the people won't look into it and then half of them won't care. Uh, so that that was, I mean, uh, Barr and somebody else were held in contempt of Congress back in February, I think, January or February. But Bill Barr is in charge or his underling is in charge of enforcing that. So they said, no. Nah, Um, I think it might have been Bolton even. It might have been Bolton and Barr, but it was definitely Barr. And the Department of Justice is in charge of enforcing contempt of Congress charges. And they just said, no. Not, not gonna do it. So the term that I would say to use for whenever something is redacted and then that redaction is removed would be unmasking. There we go. I, I, that that is a word that the Republisphere has been used has been using a lot in talking about the unmasking of Flynn in the uh, FISA courts. But from my understanding, I do not really like spying on uh, like the NSA spying on people uh, and whatnot. But it is a system that was put- why why is that, Darren? Do you have something to hide? <laughs> yes <laughs> every human being does i'm just fucking around <laughs> i know <laughs> uh but again it's a, a system that was working just fine for the republicans until it they, got focused on them it got focused on them so but usually the way those go is okay they've got american b talking to whoever they're monitoring and then some weird shit gets said. They say, okay, let's find out who this person is so we can see if they have any other connections going on. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, fuck the police. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's all fucked up. I don't know. Um, what were we talking about before I ran? Okay, so Flynn? the documents were unmasked due yes. to the Flynn trial. So I'm going to say that Barr trying to get the Flynn trial dropped while redacting the Mueller report to not allow people the information that they need as to why Flynn even actually was admitting guilt and testifying and doing the things that he was going to do, this kind of technically backfired on Barr because they're like, no, Flynn's guilty as fuck, and the judge decided that this stuff needs to be unmasked. And that overturns Barr's ability to redact it because of the actions that he's done. So they're basically drawing in and saying that Barr's choice to redact this information is because he is trying to pledge into a cover-up. And this is highly illegal, really rotten shit, to use our parlance for it. (laughs) That's basically what the judge declared. And then he just said, unmask all of this evidence because this needs to come out. This is what Flynn was involved with. And this is what Barr's trying to cover up. Did I get that right? Am I, am I distilling that down? I believe so. I don't think the entire report has been unredacted. No, but... just the portions that the judge in question had access to because he deemed that he needed it for his decision when he was reviewing all of this, this independent judge. Is that right? Yes. It was, and that was either in the case that has specifically to do with Flynn or just a case that has to do with the Mueller report because there are there were there have been lawsuits to get it totally... well it's a tangled it's a yeah. tangled web all the Mueller report and Flynn and all that stuff it's all part of this vast overall conspiracy of dunces and yeah. all the dumb shit that they pulled to try and get this done uh the only I... thing that's really keeping this from being a full-fledged like conspiracy theory style story that like 
Oliver Stone would have created is the idiocy of all the people involved and like all of the dumb choices that they make because they're literally screaming to the hills that they're committing the crimes that they're making as they're doing it. And people are like, wow, I can't believe you're being so brazen by this. And while they're shocked, the hand goes back into the same cookie jar. Yeah. And, and a lot of things, you know, that don't seem as serious because there's in a string of tweets that gets deleted instead of on papers that get shredded uh, and thing and things like that. And also the weak ass response by Nancy Pelosi. She could have subpoenaed Bolton. Why? I mean, do you have any kind of suspicions as to why Pelosi is slow walking this and just letting it happen? Like, is she is this some kind of a power move on these established as establishment Dems side, as far as you're concerned, that she's letting everything go to pot just so they can get more and more consolidation of hatred behind them all? Like all the other like the Republican side of things for allowing this to happen. Is she just letting the country go to shit because it's consolidating her power and the power of the establishment Dems because the worse things get, the more we're going to turn to them and be like, no, we don't need to go so far left. Can we just get rid of this administration? Like, is that their move? Like let everybody suffer more so they can get more power. Cause that makes them just as bad in my book. If that's what it is. It seems somewhere around there. I mean, uh, of course also, I, I mean, I, I don't like her, but she probably knows more about Washington politics than I do, but that's not necessarily a good thing in the ultimate motive of a thing. But I mean, we have seen the Democratic Party and the main Democratic donor base going after progressives everywhere. I mean, there are, I think, four or five people trying to beat uh, AOC in her primary this week. Yeah, and a lot of that is being propped up by Trump donors, too, like the the major Trump money and then the establishment Dem money is all going towards these more moderate purple Democrat types that they're trying to put into place. So, and let's, let's not mince words. Yeah. I, when I say that they're just as bad, the establishment Dems is what I'm talking about, not the progressive Dems that have been trying, but like Pelosi and a lot of like these establishment folks that have been around for a long time and the neoliberal types that are, <laughs> that are there they're essentially Republicans with a blue shirt over top. You know, that's that's really all they are. We don't have a left in this country. We have moderates or slightly right and then far right. That's all we have anymore. Like everything has shifted so far to the right that we don't even have a left anymore in this country, like at all. And if you're progressive, if you're like, hey, maybe we should um, – stop spending money on killing people and start spending money on educating and keeping people happy and healthy and take care of the American people. They're like, you're a fucking socialist. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you're the extreme for wanting the basic needs that, you know, a country should do for its citizens. <laughs> and literally every other developed nation in the world does, but us, <laughs> we're like the only one that doesn't. And yeah, Ed Schumer, I believe actually went Chuck Schumer. If, if, if you're new to that name, uh, New, New <laughs> if you're York. nasty, Chuck Schumer. If you're nasty, <laughs> he I am pretty sure yesterday endorsed. Oh, I totally people. derailed you, didn't I? <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, one of her opponents in the primary, even though in the 2018 primary the DNC cast down an edict that if you work with a pack that is working to primary against a sitting Democrat, you will lose all funding. That was the main, the main line. AOC was in charge of one of the fuck yous to that platform in 2018. And then we have Schumer wanting the, yeah, the, the purple Democrat, the, the Joe Manchin type, the what? What's her name? That's running down in Kentucky. Uh, shit, what is her name? The sort of Republican Democrat fighter pilot lady. That. Uh, yeah, but like, okay, there there is certain levels of what evil are you going to be be able to accept that we do have to kind of swallow that hard pill. And in Kentucky, getting rid of fucking Mitch McConnell 
like anything besides Mitch McConnell would probably be good. Like they're <laughs> Jesus Christ, like another Jim Jordan in Kentucky would be better than <laughs> than McConnell because of the heinous evil shit he's done to consolidate his power. Like, you know, there's a reason why he's hated so much in his own fucking state, you know? <laughs> like, the guy is fucking rotten, but we're not talking, you know, in that situation, like, having a purple dem is kind of what you need because look at the state, you know what I mean? But then again, West Virginia shocked the shit out of me because they had an openly trans woman that got elected to some kind of a Senate position there or something, didn't they? Uh, or a I state believe, senator I or something? Who, I believe that was West Virginia. Like, I've been to West Virginia. I am 100% shocked that that happened. <laughs> I, I have a very close friend that, that lives there still to this day that I, I was friends with in college, and I've gone to visit him, and I've spent time with the people there. They're good people, but at the same time, they're not exactly what I would call progressive. But apparently I was wrong. Apparently the kids that have been voting in there have had a say, and I'm still in shock that that happened. And hell, I, if you would have told me that there would be a fully democratic control of Virginia, I would have never thought that would have happened. So I guess I should just shut the fuck up and sit down like the old man I am. Well, and last year, Andy Bashir got elected governor of Kentucky, and he's he's a Democrat. So do you think that Amy McGrath has a better, name. a better chance of beating, uh, what's his name, Charles Booker, who's running against her in the primary? I don't know. I honestly don't. I haven't been paying that close enough attention to the individual states. I'm more concerned with what's going to happen with McConnell and what's going to happen with um, the presidential term stuff. And then I do want more Democrats, obviously, across the states. But my main focus is what's going on and what's going to happen now with essentially on the borderline excuse for being able to declare a national emergency and just cancel an election and then the fascist state taking over full fledged. Cause that's the part that I feel like is going to happen. So that's like, I, and we, we talked about it. Like one of the things that I wanted to get to is uh, Biden's running mates, because like, I have no fucking clue. Cause it, it works. We're stuck with Biden, right? We're that's the horse we're going to back. Now we're going to have to bet to try and unseat the fascist dictator Cheeto Mussolini. <laughs> Yeah, unless unless he dies or some uh, somebody keeps looking into one of those sexual assault allegations, uh, much like the people who, if they're still voting for Trump now, there will not be any sway. I feel like a decent amount of people who generally vote protest or vote third party, uh, some of that group of people has some have made the decision to do the, I don't know, the the safety vote, the get on the train that's taking you closest place you're trying to go train or whatever, and then there are the people that are saying, no, my vote is my vote. Uh, if a vote for Biden is a vote for Trump and not voting for Biden is a vote for Trump, then not voting for Trump or Biden is a vote for both of them, so it cancels them out. There's all sorts of things going around. <laughs> But I think well, you, the people that have not decided now that they are going to do the Biden vote, no matter how much like shit it tastes, I also think that 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 mind will not be changed between the next, what, four months, July, August, September, October, November. Oh. Yeah, whatever we've got left. So, yeah, and I know that there are still candidates like the Libertarian Party's got one and then the Green Party's got one as well, but essentially it's coming down to, I mean, they're not going to get enough of a vote. We're talking libertarian party candidates get like what? Five, 10% sometimes of sometimes. total votes. Yeah. If that. Not 15, which I think is the, the magic number. Yeah. And green party sometimes gets enough to where they can get on the ballot. And I already Some... forgot that guy's name. <laughs> <laughs> right but he, he he's got like he's almost got enough right to get on the ballot like almost but not quite so i mean like the they got their candidates and it's and i i don't want to be dismissive of it but it's almost like a 
it's like a gesture candidate where they put somebody up and then they try to offer an alternative and then basically the the rest of the country is just like yeah that that's nice but that's not going to work because they just don't they don't have the numbers you know that's that's just the way it is like the people who are supporting supporting vermin supreme seriously are not going to get him anywhere near a ballot that's just never going to happen you know well maybe someday who knows but like he was the nominee <laughs> last time but he <laughs> did not win this time he lost to joe jorgensen <laughs> okay but I mean, for all intents and purposes, we need to focus in on this fucked up bullshit two-party system that we are all saddled with until we can completely demolish everything and rebuild from the ashes, which who knows? We got four months left and the way things are kind of compounding in the interest, it just may go there. I mean, statues are hanging from fucking lampposts in this country. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen in the next four months? <laughs> so, but if everything goes to the normal standard of things, we need to focus in on two men specifically, Trump and Biden, and then possibly a running mate for Biden that is a person of color, and then also a female, because that's what he's leaning towards because that's like his symbolic gesture. It's like his McCain move to the the far left of the Democratic Party, right? Where he's like, well, how about I, I give you a black woman as my running mate? How about that? Like, that's his thing that he's going for, right? Uh, I think he is on record saying that he intends to appoint a woman of color to the Supreme Court. And so far, he is only committed to picking a woman as his vice president running mate. It's kind of, I He's not... Well, the Biden campaign has never been in touch. I think I, I've said this before, but somebody signed my show email up to the Donald Trump mailing list. I have 50 emails in the last three days. There's Don Jr., there's... Ivanka, there's the Trump campaign, there's Americans for Trump, there's 50 fucking emails all asking for money and spewing propaganda, as as well as the daily email from the White House that I, I've, I've stopped sort of jumping into comment sections generally in, in, place, in public pages, but I still get the, the daily email from the White House. That's like my baby steps away from seeing what the, the lunatics are saying. Um, okay so that's that's been interesting but yeah the uh the the biden campaign has not really been uh, very active I, of course he's been more active he went to some some protests and he went and he talked to some people and he wore the mask and that was ridiculed for being a uh, uh, reactionary or something and, and yeah, yeah it's like look at him wearing a mask outside his house when he's not wearing a mask in his house how dare he listen to the advice of my cdc um, <laughs> look at him being able to lift his own glass of water with one hand and drink from it like a normal adult <laughs> but their plan seems to be just don't say anything anymore because you're not doing well when you say things. Yeah, he's a fucking gaff machine. So really, all all they're running on right now is vote Biden. He's not Trump. Yeah. Right. That's literally what they're running him on. He's not Trump. Hey, remember Obama? You know things were okay enough for you to ignore everything. Don't you want that again? Um, yeah. Don't you want it back to normal where you can ignore our normal war crimes that happen in other nations and not your own? Don't you want that? Don't you want an end to the war crimes in your own nation? <laughs> That's basically what they're running on. <laughs> so Klobuchar dropped out, said she, you know, she, she, I don't think she was going to win anyway, but dude, she, she's the one that let Shavin go for like a bunch of fucking crimes before this happened in Minneapolis, right? Isn't she the one that did that? That's her, isn't it? She was the lead prosecutor in those days. Uh, there, There is dispute on if she was in charge of the case, but sort of like some of the things that people have said about Kamala Harris, she was in charge at the office. Uh, Kamala Harris, of the you know, the old school Democrat things, like, oh, I'm going to get some cops 
I'm going to get some former cops and that'll show that we're tough. And I, I think the Biden campaign long ago gave up appealing to the left people or the left of Democrat people and started more thinking about appealing to Republicans and even more ridiculously trying to peel off Trump voters. That's not going to happen if it hasn't happened yet. And then repealing to the Republicans, it's OK, look, we've got all these former prosecutors. So in the last few weeks, it's sort of jumbled the likelihood of some people and other people. You know, Elizabeth Warren is still a top contender, but now the CNN and the MSNBC and the the people that generally influence Biden are kind of telling him that he should not pick a, a white lady, at, at well, least for the best the best messaging that they're trying or their their plan. I mean, the reason that Warren kept going after Sanders was because she was trying to go for a sort of diet soda version of his policies and getting people that way. That was like her main interest. And then when that failed, she decided just to straight up attack him and then went to a different route. And then she was basically like repealing some of the things that she had said, not repealing, but like changing some of the things that she was trying to sell herself on before and decided that she was going to drop some of the, like the free school, you know, call free college for community colleges or something like that. Like she decided to drop that in an effort to get Biden to notice her. Like, you know, the girl that like puts her hair up in a ponytail and just is like, pick me, you know, for the, the high school jock or whatever. <laughs> like that's kind of what she was trying to do. And then when that didn't really seem to work, no one's really kind of talking about her now, but you're saying she's still kind of in the running. I think right now, from what I've been able to tell, the main people that are getting looked at are uh, Susan Rice got brought into the conversation. Do you remember her? Barely. The okay. ones that I was focused in on was um, I didn't want Klobuchar and I didn't want Harris. Like as long as they're both out, because I don't want former <laughs> former prosecutors or cops or pro cop people to be in the office. That's all I, I definitely don't want. Well, Harris, I also don't want Biden, but I'm stuck with him. So I guess I'll just put up. Harris is still a front runner. It's kind of, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it depends on who you ask, but she's still up there. There's uh, Elizabeth Warren. Susan Rice is newly being talked about Stacey Abrams, but she has also said that she has not been contacted by Biden. She's she's just one of the front runners when they're polling whoever they poll when they poll the Democratic Party. Yeah, you know, Stacey Abrams is up there. Uh, she was uh, she was a candidate for governor in Georgia against the guy who ran the election and fudged it enough that he could win. Um, let's see. Uh, Tammy Duckworth. Uh, she's she's the veteran. Uh, the veteran representative, um, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, who's been getting a lot of positive attention lately for her uh, coronavirus response. I, I feel like Michigan is one of the three states in the U.S. that are temporarily on track to decrease coronavirus instead of uh not just decrease drop. not not just decrease because there's a lot of even my state is on a decrease right now but it's a dramatic decrease i believe is the terms that they've been using um new york because their numbers were so high because of any drop off has actually put itself that state has actually put itself in that same decrease because of the draconian style of lockdowns that they did and i mean they're necessary i don't want when i say draconian i don't mean that they're unnecessary i mean they had to do it you know, like stay the fuck home or you're going to kill somebody is something that's going to happen in those states. Uh, the way Michigan handled it may have pissed off all of their residents, including, you know, bringing the ire of Trump's folks and the white supremacists there. But it clearly worked. Um, Nebraska just kind of lucked out. They put in, you know, they closed restaurants and everything like that. And businesses adapted and overcame. And we're just a low enough population in this state that we did OK. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's talk of that. There's also the, uh, I think the expected largest minority 
demographic, while that is increasingly less of a solid voting voting block in in America, uh, they're expecting the Hispanic vote to be the largest. Uh, well, considering that we've still got kids in concentration camps, which is another Bolton reveal that they actually are concentration camps. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and considering that they are predominantly of Hispanic descent, that would make sense that there would be a very mobilized Latinx vote. Yeah, uh, my 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 experience in interviewing and talking with immigrants is that there is still the random uh, angry Republican immigrant. <laughs> you know, I did this, so punish someone else. Um. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, there's there's like nine, eight or nine ladies that are talked about a lot. That's Stacey Abrams. There's uh, Tammy Duckworth, Kamala Harris, Klobuchar just dropped out. Um, Susan Rice, Elizabeth Warren, Gretchen Whitmer. Elizabeth Warren's the only one that is for, uh, eliminating private health insurance. Uh, she that's another thing that she did a turnaround just in the hopes of getting a vice presidency yep uh only abrams duckworth harris bottoms rice and whitmer are un, under 60 yeah because that's another thing is um if warren if it was biden warren she's 70 he's 77 they're already been they've already been talking about how the sort of plan is whoever gets picked as vice president is supposed to be maybe the one that runs for president the the next election because he's too fucking old and now you know, Sanders is old too but uh his that that's that's been floated uh, like we were I think we almost got to this but I didn't get to it when we're talking about people maybe following through with these charges and these investigations into Trump is, and I don't mean, and maybe you've already had this thought, so but I don't want to put an extra worry in anybody's head, but something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is if Trump loses, he could run again the next time. Because you can't be elected for two terms as a president. So, I is do you think that he would do that four years later if he's still alive? Uh, I would hope that someone would stop him from trying, but I would not put it past him to want to try and be president again. I mean, that's definitely not something that I would fear, but my thought is that a lot of these maneuvers that they're doing is because of the idea that the whole a sitting president can't be charged with a crime. So my thought is all these things that he has done and all these crimes that he has committed that the Mueller report does. I mean, the first thing that anyone who gets elected decides Donald Trump into the presidency should do automatically because he's already opened the door to turn your DOJ into your own political hit system would be to go at him as hard as possible and make him go away permanently. Like that would be the first thing that I would do, like and and then like like essentially anyone should do for law and order. You know, you should come right out and be like, okay, here's the whole of the report. Here's everything completely unredacted. Here's all of the evidence. Here's everything. We are going to trial. This is treason. You know what I mean? Like pure and simple. They should do it, but I don't know. I fear that that won't happen. And if that doesn't happen, then I would not put it past Trump to try and run again. But perhaps it would be the. Uh whatever his party would be called. The Trumpupicans the, or the MAGA CAG party. Uh, then, or then the they would just neo Nazis. <laughs> yeah. The the neo Nazi party. Um God, so fucked up. But he he would be he would he would leech off more Republican voters that time around. I I don't know if you checked out the I stand with website that uh, interviews 
a bunch of all all the candidates or compiles the answers to a bunch of different issues from all the candidates and you can answer the questions and it's got a sliding scale of importance and stuff like that i i don't know what it was but i agree one percent with the republican party or one percent or less they had me as and that's probably something to do with the current platform of removing soldiers from uh all the bases <laughs> overseas but i had a uh, 13 percent agreement with uh, joe jargonson or whatever the libertarian lady who seems to be kind of like the stereotype that people say when they make fun of the libertarian party as being the of course we know some more regular or uh less republican libertarians but this is i'm i'm for legal drugs and abortion choice but defund everything and give give the medical the medical industry is too regulated give it to the free market sort of stuff like she's she's against medical regulations she's against lowering the cost of drug prices she's against um requiring insurance companies to cover people who have pre-existing conditions including coronavirus uh just all these things i'm like shit 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 and she's like anti-union anti-labor but she's pro-drugs <laughs> and <laughs> yeah it's basically pro anything that makes us money con anything that takes away that money even taxes and don't you dare make me care about another individual because it's my personal freedom to ignore them and they should have their own personal freedom and pull them up by their own bootstraps that's basically it like the healthcare thing, they don't want any regulations because they don't want anybody telling them anything that they can and they can't do. And the problem with that is you're taking too much into personal responsibility. And as we've seen from the Trump presidency, human beings cannot be trusted with anything. Therefore, you need laws and regulations. You need other human beings to keep them responsive to the bad choices that they make. I mean, there's a reason why the guillotines got put away after the last revolution but if you want to start taking away the things that are the protections, like the unions and the things that keep the workers happy, you can have that back. You can have those revolutions back. I mean, it's already clear that with people out of work and the ability to mobilize like they are these days, that that is not something that is too far off if you keep fucking around and you'll find out. You know, And that's not me threatening this. That's me being observant that... We're at a jumping off point, like pretty much something bad's going to happen either way with this world. You know, we may or may not be able to undo the whole climate change problem, sure. But at this point with coronavirus and the way that people are out of work and everybody's hurting and everybody's had enough and they've all been cooped up too long, like you keep fucking around with the general populace on things, you're going to find out like because the mobilization is something I have never seen before in my life. Ever, And I think it has a lot to do with the economy pretty much being shut down right now. And that's why the work week was scheduled the way that it was. They want to keep you so fucking busy every day that you've got not enough time to take care of your own shit, let alone worrying about mobilizing to take care of the rest of the shit. And, you know, until we can all go back to normal, which is why the Republicans are pushing for it, people aren't as distracted. And once they mobilize, it's all over with. And it may already be past the point of no return for people being able to mobilize because, I mean, you know, cops are doing their whole blue flu and everything, but all it really takes is all of these nail salons, all of these various places that people are being forced to work at for the privileged to come in and get their daily cheddars breakfast or whatever. All it takes is for them to just not show up and all the Karens of the world are going to freak out and lose their shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, that's all it's going to take. You know, it's just like, everybody just needs to keep mobilizing, man. But it just feels like that's going to happen. Like the, the government's been fucking around so long over the last four years with everything. And now we're finding out <laughs> it's basically what's happening. Yeah. I don't know what, what's going to come of it or how it's going to end up happening. But all of these various gestures, like the, the various laws and things and the quote unquote reforms, um, some of the cities are defunding. Some of the stuff is starting to happen for the demilitarization. But um, 
I honestly feel like people need to pay attention and it's not enough because it's ingrained in our entirety of the system. Even the 13th Amendment needs to be changed. You know, we need to get rid of that whole, you you know, no slavery except for imprisonment. We need to get rid of that. We need it to be no slavery. Because just because you've committed a crime and are now in jail does not mean that you are no longer a human being. You are no, you're not, you know, what is it, nine tenths or whatever they used to, or seven tenths that they used to consider slaves, like former slaves. Something like that. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm feeling like there is a possibility for, you know, another overhaul. And this is the thing that our founding fathers had been thinking would end up happening for the revolution. But what they didn't realize was it's not going to be more slave owners that are doing it. It's the, <laughs> the ancestors or the uh, descendants of former slaves at this point that are getting back what's due them. <laughs> I saw the uh, dock workers, Union in Oakland and somewhere else went on a solidarity strike yesterday for Juneteenth. Um, yeah, especially here in, in the States. I think that's one of the things that uh, comes up at least early, if not often, when talking with uh, listeners in the UK and whatnot of, of the show and friends that I've made from this is the whole idea of your health insurance being anchored to employment which is another way to quell rebellion. Is, yeah. Yeah. No, it totally is. I mean, if you are protesting and you lose your job because you're protesting, you no longer have health insurance and they just give you a quadruple whammy of your financial security. And that's basically what it is. Your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is all anchored to capitalism in some way shape or form to the nth degree like we are living in an Ayn Rand nightmare you know and like that's the world that by definition libertarianism wants is everybody tied to however much money they can actually make you know and that's that's your only, your only value is how much value you create in the free market and that is not how humanity should be we are, by nature, a pack animal. We take care of each other, or we should be taking care of each other. Our ancestors, the primates, do that quite well. You don't really see lone apes. Apes together strong, you know? <laughs> they even said that in the Planet of the Apes movie. Apes together strong. The problem is, is that we are dumb, dangerous, panicky versions of apes that are too self-involved with our Snapchat filters to really kind of realize that the rest of the world is getting screwed around us. But as long as we got ours and we got a modicum of happiness, we're fine. You know, and I'm, I've been victim of that myself before in the past where I'm like, I'm just focusing in on me. I'm just focusing in on me. And there's so many things that have been thrown at us over the last couple of years. And it's particularly this year, 2020 has been a real fucking pain that a lot of us are starting to realize that this system doesn't work the way that this is, does not work. You know, like, if you've had to ask for help for somebody during these crises, if you've had to ask for, you know, even just like a little bit of money to get you through, and even if you ended up paying that person back or, or whatever, you know, you can't quite say, you know, I can do it on my own and the free market will take care of me because it didn't. Your fellow apes did, God damn it. It has been, those have been the, the sparkling moments of seeing communities band together and, like Seattle, like the, the free zone in Seattle, like what if that catches on the nightmare, the horror of socialist living like that? We got to quell that man. Send in the bikers. Yep. Chaz or what's the other chop chop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there was a shooting last night or this morning. I don't know if you'd seen that. Guarantee you it was a white nationalist. I can, I can, I don't even have to read. I know that was a white nationalist. They're all over the place causing shit be true there's uh the the guy that punched the protester in the back of the head in front of the cop down in i didn't even know that there was much ohio south of cincinnati but in bethel ohio where there's that like one girl protest and she's getting harassed by bikers and stuff and there was another guy somewhere else in town that got punched in the back of the head in front of a cop who said he didn't see anything of course but Eventually, there's like, well, look, here's the video of it happening. So now you 
have to arrest him. I guess he was involved in ripping up that girl's sign. Uh, it's, it's stuff stuff spreading, and there's it seems to be a lot of people who say, you know, I didn't pay any attention, or I used to be kind of a piece of shit, and now I like that. Uh, the gentleman in the wheelchair that said, "It's sorry it took me so long, but I'm here. I had a lot to learn." Yeah, there, there's that. There's the. And I I really feel like I I've seen this in in people I know, but the the other saying of you know. All mothers were summoned when George Floyd called for his mom. Yeah, that There's... sign, Jesus. Just you just brought that up, and I'm tearing up thinking about that. You know, that's I, I've, it's terrible that this is. You know, I mean, at the very beginning of this presidency, there was the encouragement to start being rougher with people. And then constant encouragement to stay that way and threatening the protesters, Antifa, communist, socialist, will, whatever. It's, yeah, it's, it's. Uh, uh, okay, can, can we just have like a little bit of a grammar slash semantic argument here? Because that's, that's for the show, the psychosemantic, right? All mm -hmm. right, so I broke this down on Cinema PsyOps as politely and as sort of entertainment value as I can, but I'm going to be very frank more when I break it down here. Anti stands for against. Fa is for fascism. It's the shortening of anti-fascism. If you are encouraging people to go after anyone who is against fascism, you are preaching for the negative. So therefore you are saying we need to prop up what? When Trump says that anyone who is protesting the police are Antifa, regardless of what it is, he is saying that the protests are against fascism. So if the protests are against police and fascism, what does that make the police force in this country? Think that through. <laughs> All right, so Trump is essentially saying the police are fascist and we are a fascist state. And he is encouraging that and he wants them to amp that up. And when he brought in the military to try and quell that and as a show of force, that is not the move of a free state. That is specifically in the Constitution that you should not be doing that. That is fucking illegal. You don't use it on your own people. That's not what the U.S. military is for. All of the generals have come out against that. Like shitloads of fucking generals, not every single, every single one, but like very frank speaking military men who have no time for explaining themselves in any way, shape or form. And every word has to count are flat out saying that was wrong. If you are going after people, specifically calling them Antifa and you want to get rid of Antifa and you keep hammering Antifa you are saying you are pro-fascist, pure and simple. You are saying you want another Hitler. <laughs> you want another Mussolini. You want another Saddam Hussein. You want that. And if your object of what you want for that fascist rule is Trump, you are essentially calling Trump a fucking fascist. You are saying he is a Mussolini. You are saying he is a fucking Hitler. You are saying he is a <laughs> fucking Saddam Hussein. And you are saying that you like that. You don't get to wave the flag and call thin blue line and say that you don't want anything but freedom when you are also going against things that are against fascism. You can't do all of that. You are doing a double negative and therefore pro-fascism. No more mincing words on this. You're a fucking fascist at this point. And we, I mean, maybe all of the stuff that we talked about will be a moot point because I I feel like Trump is going to defeat Trump now because I saw that today Kaylee McEnany, or however the fuck you say her last name, I still, you know. Is that the that. new press secretary? The yes. fucking fascist party doll? Yeah. Is that what's his name's wife? No, that's a different fucking fascist. I, I'm getting all my fascists confused. There, there are many. But she said that Trump is definitely anti-fascist so if all anti-fascists are terrorists, then he Trump's a terrorist. Will, he's a terrorist. All right, case closed. The show's 
show's over until the next election, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're problem solved. Trump is going to take care of himself, I guess. No, yeah. that's not how this fucking works. Uh... You, you see, you don't understand, Darren. What you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. What the press secretary is saying and what the president is saying is not what they mean. But she also said that he likes to hire people with countervailing viewpoints. How could that not be true? <laughs> How could anything that any that comes out of anything having to do with this modern day administration be true? How could any of it be true? I don't know. But man, yeah. she she went to Harvard and Georgetown. But I guess That's... everybody's got a price. <laughs> Uh, how much of this is the fucking bacony stench of goddamn Steve Bannon's hand? Like, oh. how much of this is him setting it up and then going away? Like, Stephen Miller is his fucking toady, right? Miller, right? oh, Miller's so horrible, and he's so, he's like thirty. He's ugh. he'll be he'll be the new head when David Duke dies, or whatever. Uh, or when Bannon, yeah, Bannon. I mean, Bannon still got his hand in some people's assholes. Pulling. So they had a falling out because Bannon was taking too much credit for everything that he was doing, and Trump didn't like that because Trump wanted to be the focus. Trump wanted to be all famous, so he made Bannon leave. And then Bannon found a way to be using his sycophantic little fucker, that is Stephen Miller, um, to move along with the agenda, whatever it actually is. With and the, the they're all back. Nazi posts. <laughs> the what? The eighty-eight Nazi posts. Oh yeah, God, we didn't even talk. There's so much horrible shit that we just can't even get it all out. Yeah, so that was Trump's like social media team. It was eighty-eight fucking posts with a fourteen-word opening, all using the upside-down red triangle to be a symbol of the people that are opposing Trump he's tying himself in or whoever decided to do this is tying himself in with Nazism and Hitler very specifically. And that's the thing that I was talking about earlier, where I feel like that's the move that they're trying to make, where they're like trying to basically dog whistle these white supremacist, white nationalists, whatever you want to fucking talk about neo-Nazis into moving forward with whatever bullshit boogaloo plans that they have because this is like their backup last ditch effort, right? Like they want to try and start enough civil unrest so that they can cancel the election. Like they're trying and they're trying and they're trying. And then social media finally did the right thing. Even fucking Facebook dropped those ads, but then nothing else came of it. Nobody really seems to be doing anything about like these dog whistles. Nobody's being fired that made that decision to post that stuff. No, do we even know? who called for that to happen on the Trump campaign? I mean, I know who I suspect it is, Stephen Miller, but do we know for sure <laughs> who chose to do that? No. I'm, I'll, I, I'll, I would bet that Miller sort of headed up the young people outreach, the, the social media and the tech stuff, him or Kushner. And this this feels more like Miller than Kushner. I mean, Kushner really would only embrace the hard, more hardcore Nazi stuff if he was going to make a lot of money. I really think. That seems to be his main... His main goal is uh, he and Ivanka to make as much money as possible and help out you know, his friends and his business associates. Miller just seems to be a boogaloo boy running around the White House, be like, yeah, let's do a speech on Juneteenth in Tulsa and then do all this other Nazi shit and uh, here's the language you need to use when you talk about people. Uh, I feel right. like so, Miller's more who, of the, yeah. Why, why are they not calling? Why is no one calling for figuring out who it is that chose to do these social media posts and then a firing? Like any other administration would do that. But in this case, it's just another one of those, oh, well, we're we're inexperienced. We didn't know that that's what that meant. They fucking knew what it meant. They fucking knew what they were doing. They did that on purpose. This was a huge fucking dog whistle that they wanted people to know about. Well, whoever's responsible for that should not be allowed in any form of government. Let's know who did this decision. You know? And, like, 
at this point, would anyone even accept, oh, no, it looks like, uh, you know, an intern did it and they've been fired? You know, no, I'm not talking that. Like, somebody higher up made that decision. That was not just some offset thing that happened to fit all of these patterns of these not-so-subtle bullshit things that the, all the neo-Nazis do anyway. They're always finding a way to put 88 into everything or 1488 or anything like that. The 14 words or 14 this, 1488. They're always donating to each other's causes the exact amount of $14.88, you know? Like, anybody who listens to I Don't Speak German can get all the education they need on this kind of stuff. It's a real quick way to understand that fucking fascist mentality and this neo-Nazi-style mentality. It's not a big shocker that they're doing that stuff. It's very easy to to see. And no one puts out 88 fucking Facebook posts of all the same material by mistake. That's a very intentional thing. No one mashes that many sponsored fucking boost posts at like five to ten dollars a piece by mistake. That just doesn't happen. You know? So That's someone right. needs to be held accountable for this shit. But in this administration it will not happen. And there's just so much more horrid shit the next day that we all just kind of forget about it. Yeah, it's the picking your battles when fighting with a child. It's uh, and that was another thing with that that happening and with the uh, the the campaign ramble getting pushed to the twentieth. That also might have obscured or completely eliminated any focus on the shit the DOJ was trying to do with removing the prosecutor. If that happened, because that happened right when the campaign rant would be in full swing. Yeah, they were trying to use it as a cover up thing. That's one thing that Trump's strategies work really, really well. He, for whatever reason, has a really good intuition on what to do to divert people's attention. Like he knows how to con and to keep people busy. Like he knows enough to do it just on the surface to distract people just enough. And we saw that like the very first, like when he came down in the fucking Trump building and was talking about all the paperwork, how he's divesting himself from the businesses and then all these files and folders of just empty fucking papers just stacked on a table. Like if you go over there and look at it, it's all blank paper anyway. It was just a facade of a thing that he wanted to show people that what he's doing, that he's working on something, but you could tell it was bullshit. Yeah. You know, I, like I think that, the paper that's... was even the wrong size. It was extra right. large. So it showed out of the envelope more. Yeah, he shoved a bunch of 11 by se- somebody shoved a bunch of 11 by 17 papers into an 8 by 10 folder basically. <laughs> it was something along those lines. It was all clearly fake, but it was just enough to where if you're a fucking idiot, you'd you'd fall for that. But the minute people were like looking at the table and like getting closer to take pictures, they're like, "No, no, move away. You nothing to see here." You know, it's sensitive private. documents. <laughs> attorney attorney client confidentiality. You're sued right. now. I'm suing you. You're right. Right. So, like, he is good at doing just enough veneer stuff to fool the idiots, which works fine whenever you're just a fucking money laundering piece of shit in New York. But when you're the president of the United States, there's always a paper trail. There's always accountability, you know, even though you're trying to cover all that stuff up. I mean, there's he's keeping trying to do all these end run illegal, horrible, like hidden secretive things. But there's so much stuff in place that he has to still deal with that he can't circumvent that it's I, mean, I don't want to say it's all going to come out but it all could still come out and they're banking it all on him getting reelected long enough to just kind of make it all go away and to run out the statute of limitations on a lot of his crimes but other ones aren't going to wear out either so <laughs> you know it's just like what, what what's his end game whenever he can't be president anymore like the end game is always going to be he becomes dictator for life and then makes it all go away you know like that's his end game Or, you know, people forget about it eventually on the middle of the seventh year of hell. But it's just like it fucking can't unless we're all dead. (laughs) You know, he's just keeping those plates spinning. That's what he's good at. He's a fucking circus act, keeping the plates spinning and hoping no one notices when the plates fall. Yeah, that's his relationship with Vince McMahon. Uh, (laughs) He's got that he's got that that veneer. He's. Sure, he had some, uh, some uh, brainstorming sessions when uh, Linda was still his secretary of what was she, secretary of commerce, Se- or secretary uh, of labor. Yeah, I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, Linda McMahon was Secretary of Labor. I think Secretary of Commerce is Mitch McConnell's wife. Um, yeah, drain the swamp. Uh, all right, so we're not sure who any front runners are um, for Biden's running mates. There's still that's still up in the air. So at this point, like focusing in on specific policies of anyone may not really matter because if you're picking Biden, you're pretty much picking. <laughs> They're going to have to be pulling the establishment Dem party line anyway. So it's whatever Biden says goes with the running mates. So what's that matter? I didn't feel that bad for not doing more research on them then. And yeah, uh, he's more inf influen uh, influenceable than, than Trump. But yeah, I mean, all the odds and all that shit are out the window with the way things are changing because they were banking on having a lot of cops and strong law enforcement people. You know, like uh, Val Denning, Demings uh, was the Democratic rep that I, I think I might have mentioned her earlier, but she was one of the up and coming people uh, at the beginning of June, end of May. But when she she was the first uh, woman in charge of the Orlando Police Department, but during that time, they had a lot of excessive force problems. So now she's losing likelihood. But she is a woman of color in a well, swing state or in yeah. a battleground state. Okay. So it's, it's yeah. just fucked up. Like, I tried to make a point to not read any of the things that I usually read, which are far more left, because I know none of those influence the decision that's being made. So I wanted to have who's who's most likely rather than who's best, even though I know some of those things. You know, it's like Kamala Harris had a better record than Amy Klobuchar. But that doesn't mean it's a great record. What's the uh, over and under on... Because Trump's really starting to lose his shit. He had to get the rallies going again because he was feeling the pressure and this is how he blows off steam. What's the uh, over and under on the CDC demanding that he stop those again, or they don't let him do that in any of the states he wants to do it again? Because two weeks from now, you know, all of the rallies that he's held spreads COVID like a motherfucker, and all these states have to lock down, and all these battleground states that he's doing this in, or, you know, places that are friendly to him, I should say, that he's doing this in. If they end up having to lock down, then they have to admit that he was wrong and that these caused it. Or even though they'll try and spin it that it was something else, you know, like what, what's the over and under that at some point in time, the stress is going to get to him and he has another major event of some sort. Like he's eating a cheeseburger and it gets lodged in his fucking, you know, superior vina cotta, <laughs> vina cotta or something. Dave 45, uh, call back to your request from a year or two ago. <laughs> I think... I, I, he is not going to relax. I mean, he, he is only going to go more intense, more deranged, more unhinged. And... I mean, we were suspecting before that he had, on top of these other physical ailments, that he had some kind of Alzheimer's or that the uh, excessive abuse of um, Adderall and all the other stuff that he's been seen to crunch up and snort, let alone Coke and all the other stuff. Like, that has to be doing severe damage to his brain. He can barely even form a fucking sentence when he talks anymore. And any interview that you read the transcripts from are like 30 minutes of gibberish, and he repeats himself to where he even forgets that he introduced himself to the fucking reporters. Like, <laughs> they can't keep hiding it, you know, as, as well as they are. He can't even stay on the teleprompter when he knows that he has to now. Like something has to give on that. And I'm just waiting for that holding up a baby to protect himself from Johnny's shot kind of thing <laughs> moment from the shining to happen. Everybody thinks we're living in the stand, but no folks, we're living in the dead zone. Yeah. He, ugh, the missiles are flying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think right. one of the tells will be if he refuses to debate Biden. Which you can't do, right? Like, there's no way you can refuse a debate as a president. Like, you just, you can't fucking do that. Like, that, like that, the media will slaughter you. Especially if you're trying to be a strong man. If you're so fucking strong, why won't you debate? I, I 
traditionally that that is correct. Fair enough. You Tra- you've already you've already defeated my statement. Traditionally that is correct. Traditionally that is correct. Uh then there is the Tucker Carlson hour of how brave Trump is standing up against the deep state, derp state, fake news media by refusing to take part in such and such. And he's sending out Pence to debate whoever. And that that is one of the reasons why there is a lot of focus on who the Democrats are going to pick to be their nominee. Because it might be the only debates is the vice presidential debates. Because that's really the race anyway, because neither one of these feeble old fuckers is going to last that long for another term. <laughs> so have you, have you seen the suspicion and or the um, sort of like um, member Barry's positions that a lot of people had where they're like, he should pick Obama as his running mate because Obama could technically be a vice president. And that would be a way for Obama to get a third term sneaky wise I because he isn't that. technically elected. <laughs> There, there's that, and then there is the Obama could be appointed to the Supreme Court people. Because he, he was a constitutional scholar and law professor before he went into politics. Now, I think, actually, you can nominate anybody you want for the Supreme Court. And I think that's partially been shown in the lower courts, all the nominees. There's, I think the guy that got nominated to replace the head prosecutor for the Southern District of New York, has never been a prosecutor before. And, <laughs> Nor is he a lawyer, probably. <laughs> and there, yeah, there are judges who have never argued a case in court and things like that. But yeah, the uh, I think there's more people behind the make him a nominee for the Supreme Court. How do we go about removing a lot of these judges? Like, is that a presidential privilege thing that they can do where they can say, you need to go, you are not an actual judge? Is it like an impeachment process that happens in the Congress? Like, how do these types of judges get removed? Uh, in the federal court system? Yeah, the ones that are being appointed right now by the McConnell stamping machine. Yeah, they they I believe they would have to have officially done something wrong and be impeached and removed because if if a president could just tell a judge that they weren't a judge anymore a judge anymore then that's conflicting of the executive and judicial branch and that's one of the things that fucking mitch mcconnell like mm. <laughs> flames on the side of my face <laughs> <laughs> McConnell, he held like 115 or 180 empty seats the last couple years of Obama just for the, the rubber person. stamping machine. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, they're just shoving him through. And that was one of the things you were talking about him going off on his weird absent minded ramble. He brought up the judges a couple times when they were asking him about race violence or something. Uh, yeah, his so, yeah. solution to race violence is, well, we're electing all of these judges and all this stuff is going to change and everything's going to be great because we're putting in all of these judges. Yeah. I'm going to give you a list of even more judges that we're just going to put into place. Yeah. yeah, but the system itself is broken, sir, and inherently racist. Yeah, we got it fixed. We're putting in all of these white judges. <laughs> Don't white worry. male 23-year-old judges that are yeah. fresh off the docks. Yeah, Lifetime appointment. <laughs> Yeah, they've never studied anything having to do with the law, but they sure know what the federal federal federalists want. <laughs> they're, they've got the Coke agenda; they're going to go with it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so there. So there that, is that that damage is done, is what you're telling me. Is like unless they do something illegal, that damage is done, and there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why switching who the president is and who's in charge of the Senate is extremely important because how many of these judges have accepted some kind of fucked up backroom deal that we've got on record? Oh, I'm you know, sure that, that get... if they got looked into the a decent amount of them could get, get gone. I do believe that we could get rid of at least one Supreme court judge who is a rapist. 
And I'll let you guess which one it is, because there's a bunch of them that should be investigated, even to Clarence Thomas. Thanks, Biden. You're not off the hook on that one. Yeah, he's problematic, to say the least. Uh, I'm... Pro, pro-rapist pro is problematic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. It's not good. Not good. It's definitely not prudent at this juncture. Yeah, definitely not prudent. Thousand points of light. I thought this would make me feel better. All I do is feel worse now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I have I I told the last person that said, Why don't you in court do these more often? And I say, you know, I wait for people to come to me because I don't want to be the one suggesting that they diminish their sanity or mental happiness. <laughs> I'm just shocked that people want to hear us talk about this. <laughs> so for the the two people that wanted this, you're you're welcome, or three or four or one or less. <laughs> for the Darren that wanted this and was just waiting for me to come along. Yeah, I've been I've been waiting. I've been waiting. You know, I did like a casual that we haven't uh, recorded in five months. I know. I haven't been in the mental state to be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it just keeps getting fucking worse. Like coronavirus hit and I just shut down and I'm like, I will work from home. I will keep my head down and I will wait for this all to blow over. Well, I'm locked in the fucking Winchesters and everyone I love is dead. And I'm in the basement right now with a gun waiting to see what's going to happen. And I'm still trying to find that keg elevator to get out of the cellar. Like that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> and I don't see a keg elevator, dude. <laughs> Got Matt out in the shed playing video games. <laughs> that's that's how he's podcasting. Yeah, he's out in the shed. <laughs> the bunker is actually a shed that he lives in when his wife kicks him out. Go in the shed, you fucking moron. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's so fucked, man. Like, one way or another, the America that you and I grew up in is gone. That That, that much is true. That much I have come to terms with and I'm okay with. Whatever this country was is done. Whatever it's about to become is so far up in the air that I have a modicum of hope and a fucking endless sieve of dread that just keeps tripping out. For real, yeah. The, the There is something leaking out from underneath the car of but the vehicle of my optimism. Uh, yeah. And right now you're just hoping it's the air conditioning because it's a really humid day. <laughs> yeah. Is, it is humid. I can feel the heat. The temperature's rising. Uh, what? It's not the heat. It's the humanity, as the Bouncing well, Souls would say. If If we can get a wrap on everything that's happening right at this moment, every fucking catastrophe that just is compounding interest on our lives. If we can get through that hurdle, the silver lining and the hope that I want to leave everybody listening to this with is look at the mobilization of the citizens that you are seeing with these protests. Don't look at the violence that's been instilled and proven to be set off by white supremacist types and white nationalist types even though if someone's looting a target that is still a valid form of protest as far as i'm concerned when this is an economic state that we're supposed to be living in uh, the way to rebel against capitalism is to destroy capitalistic endeavors uh tea party <laughs> the boston not the fuckers that are ruining this country but the silver lining is today's youth more so than even when Darren and I were teenagers, more so than any of the kids in the 90s and the early 20 aughts that were coming up and weren't paying attention during the Bush administration. It seems like this mass that at one point in time was silent and just trying to get through life and have some avocado on their toast and just dealing with all of this debt and all this horrible shit that has been shackled upon them by the boomer generation and somewhat our generation too. Um, these kids are mobilizing these the younger crowd 
has finally said they've had enough. And while their focus may be on the racial inequality at this point, it may not stop there. The the calls for defunding police is not something that I would have ever thought I would have seen in my lifetime. And actually having it work where certain cities recognize the problems of their police and their police state that they're living in. If you would have told me that Atlanta would have seen the kind of uprising that they're getting and it would have actually pushed some stuff forward and governors and people in Georgia would fucking listen. I would have laughed in your face when I was in my 20s, man. If you would have told me that you would have seen Minneapolis change off of the death of a black man, you would have seen Minneapolis's police defunded and you know, councils put into place. I would have laughed in your face in my 20s. If I first moved to Omaha in the early 20 aughts and you would have told me that I would have seen police in Lincoln and Omaha working with community leaders in the black community in the state after two days of protests that turned violent in both cities. If you would have told me that it would have affected change only in two days in the state of Nebraska when I just first moved here, I would have laughed in your face. I am being forced to redefine my beliefs on what people can do when they mobilize. And I will admit that. And I want to give everyone that silver lining that, yeah, we may have one hell of a battle ahead of us and the country that we knew is gone. But the possibility of what we can build in the future, hey, man, that's something to look forward to. And if we can do it just in time, that we can reverse things that are happening before we have to go all Highlander 2 and build a plate to live below on the Earth, maybe, just maybe, human history will continue. But goddamn, this is a hell of a ride either way. It is It is a interesting time to be alive i'm getting more and more acquainted with uh leftist groups and uh you know uh seeing the the direct action the direct result of direct action i mean there was uh, there still are daily protests here in columbus and i think it might have moved a little bit faster when our president of the city council and one of our congresswomen got pepper sprayed on a Sunday afternoon protest by police who just ran out of nowhere and started forcing them chemically to disperse. But you know, uh, at least one of the Columbus statues have come down here. The Republican in, is... in Columbus. Let's 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 put an accent on that Columbus statue removed in Columbus, Ohio at Columbus State University. Right. And okay. The one in front of, uh, I believe, City Hall is the next one supposed to be going down. So that leaves, I think, one more. And... The statues are a nice start, but it's a symbolic appeasement, and it's not enough. And I think the crowds realize that. I just feel like the government is just trying to string them along just long enough for what, though? And we'll see where they go with it because the city council has uh, directed uh, the adoption of the eight can't wait program that is part of the steps towards abolishment of policing, but it's it doesn't abolish police. It just uh, instills eight practices or bans of practices that reduce police violence by 70 or 72 percent, according to a study. That's better than nothing, which is what most cities are trying to offer and are regretting it. So it's it's steps. There was a, <laughs> a black queer intersectional collective and some other group had a protest in front of the mayor's house this morning. I, uh, I saw some of it. There was tap dancing into a microphone attached to me- <laughs> megaphones and loudspeakers and the other fun thing. Uh, there was uh, uh, people showed up at the state house and put uh red handprints all over the stairs uh for the poli- uh, police violence of course 
that, that was... symbolic that that symbolic gesture actually really worked because it's something that you can't deny. That's like the hands that are outside of the one city hall that uh, were like the community hands or something like that. They were supposed to be reaching out and they just dumped red paint on them. So it looked like blood running out of the hands. Yeah. That is a symbolic image that will be hard to shake. Yeah. There's, it's a lot. There's a lot more. And that's what helped in the last civil rights movement was a lot of the visual of people had no idea that everyone was getting attacked with dogs and fire hoses. Like Jello Biafra why... said, don't hate the media, become the media. <laughs> right. Which is why a lot of the media has been trying to be pushed out of a lot of these civil rights unrest protests and what turns violent with it is because the cops don't want to be held accountable. I mean, you got a body camera and you're covering it with tape and you're covering your badge number with tape before you go to mobilize against the populace you are very clearly hiding evidence of who you are to get away with actions that you should not be doing. <laughs> you know, what is it you got to hide, Mr. Cover Your Body Cam badge number, you know? Like, it is obvious to just about everybody things that I have been saying all along about the police. Fuck, even Matt Psyop is now on my side when he was always trying to be Mr. Centerous Moderate about the whole fucking thing with the police. Even now, he's like, no, you're, you're fucking right. You, you're right. You've been right all along. <laughs> it took this long, but if Matt will fucking realize that, yes, cops are inherently evil, <laughs> then maybe there's hope, you know? And I, don't, I know everybody's like, oh, it's just a few bad apples, but what do they say about a few bad apples in the bunch? Something about <laughs> spoiling. I'm not sure. <laughs> right. And what what is it you have um you have uh you have uh thirteen thousand cops that are all good cops, then you have twelve bad cops. But the thirteen thousand cops don't do anything to stop the twelve bad cops from doing bad things. So what you have is thirteen thousand twelve bad cops. Yep. <laughs> thirteen twelve, my friends. Uh, I think that's I think that's it. I think we just ended the show. Decode that how you like. <laughs> yeah. Speaking so of people subtle. liking to use numbers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're back full circle just on an opposite side at once. Yeah. But, you know, it's a choice to become a cop. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's born a cop. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure some of them are very nice people. <laughs> there are very fine people on both sides of that thin blue line. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not true at all. <laughs> no, there's, like I said before earlier, when I was kind of wrapping up my thoughts and trying to cheer myself up, um, one way or another, what it is, is gone. And what we're waiting for is what it will be. Um, it took me a while to come to terms with that. And it took me a while to be at peace with that. Um, I've been living in my own little comfortable bubble for a long time here in the Midwest. And now I realize that everything around me needs to change in some way, shape or form. And I'm kind of powerless to stop that. But at the same time, all the things that need to change, I admit need to be changed. And even my own eyes have been opened up. I mean, the whole thing that I was talking about with the for-profit prisons being the new version of slavery when the 13th amendment got put into place, that's what it was all along, man. <laughs> I wasn't really reticent of that until I had seen some of the social media posts describing that and laying it out. And once I realized that I kind of came to terms with, you know, my own thoughts about the prison system even more. Like I was against for-profit prisons to begin with because they're inhumane and they're cruel, but also, you know, chain gangs making roadways and working for the state and all that other stuff. I'm, more vehemently opposed to that than I've ever been because I realized that that is state-sponsored slavery, man. That's what it is, and it's wrong. <laughs> and there are many ways to protest that. It could be in the streets. You could do it with your wallet by subtracting or adding money in the proper places. You can feed protesters. You can donate to a cause. You can educate somebody that's not going to be reached by people marching or people talking. There's a lot of cool shit people can do, and I... That is one of the things that keeps me optimistic and makes me excited is 
that I, I mean obviously I obsess over this sort of stuff but I feel like since just the very birth of this show I've had a it's all anecdotal I but I also see numbers that I didn't memorize that make me think that there is a pattern of a lot of people are moving further left in response to this extreme right jerk you can only take so much of abuse of the world around you before you stand up and say no more and the shift towards the left side of things in response to the far right it's been a long time coming in this nation just was catalyzed by the trump and you're not wrong uh, when we first started the show, uh, you know, like when I was the first part of the show with you and even before we even started doing these commentary things that we were working on together, when you were starting the show and I, I basically jumped on with you and did, you know, at the start of the Trump presidency and we did Turk 182, even I was more uh, moderate than what I am now. I myself have been caramelized in the left so much so from living through these four years. <laughs> so you're not wrong. It has definitely happened. And anyone who goes through my history on my timelines of the posts and my reactions to stories and things, it went from well, let's just return to normal now to no, no, burn it all down and build it again. That's where I'm at now. Like I've been pushed to that. Burn it all down and build it again. <laughs> That's where I'm at, man. It's a good idea. Well, it's going to happen. Now Now I know for sure it's going to happen. And you can either be at peace at it and look at a way to rebuild the new world, or you can resist what's going to happen whenever it is getting rebuilt in an image you don't like. That's your two choices. That's where we're at. We're going Star Trek or Escape from L.A.? Right. Which, which side are you on? Because Escape from L.A. sucks. The one last thing that I would like to just point in of things that you can do to affect change if you can't afford the donations, you can be a bard. You can spread the word. You can sh repost. You can share the videos that are being uploaded from the protests. You can share the news articles. You can really make sure that you're getting the word out to everyone around you as much as possible. If you can't afford to do the donations, do the donations. Yeah. I take whatever money I leave for myself for, you know, fun things like when I want to buy from a restaurant for, you know, curbside pickup or if i wanted to get myself a blu-ray or buy a movie digitally or buy some podcast gear i have a little budget of money that i allow for myself every month in the last two months since the protests have been starting to get up i've been donating that to various uh, bail funds or um, food bank type things that are dealing with that or just in general giving to rebuild certain businesses um and, you know, we've been involved with a lot of the the GoFundMe for Legion for doing this kind of work as well, which started with just helping out our fellow Legionnaires for the coronavirus and morphed into this civil rights uprising and trying to give it the right spots from our quorum. So, I mean, there's there's lots of different things that you can do. At the very least, don't be there and don't be silent. Let your voice be heard in some way, shape, or form. Do at least that. Be active just being opposed needs to be cranked up a little bit more to being actively opposed in some way. Yeah. If you at this point in your life cannot stand up and honestly say no to fascism, no to police brutality, if you are pro all of that kind of stuff, be vocal about it too so that we know what side you're on. Because this is no longer a point where you can say, oh, I'm just going to sit here in the middle and ride that fence. This is not a topic which with you can do that. There is no line of that blue to sit on. This is a very evident systemic problem that needs to be solved. And you need to be vocal about which side you're on. Whichever it is. I'm not going to tell you what you need to decide, but you can't just sit back. Because your silence is complacency and you choose the wrong side. Can't be neutral on a moving train. <laughs> The trolley problem is here. Which track are you going to choose? <laughs> don't forget to duck and cover. Find a way to be helpful. And don't let the cops take you to a second location.
This is Bo from legionpodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand scale, take a penny, leave a penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar for those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on. Well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon.